Swinet. It's time for a new era of communication in the swine industry. One that you can get the latest updates while commuting or driving to farms. Here you will have the brightest minds of the global swine industry in your pocket. You know, what you're trying to do with that is manage um, the polyunsaturated fat composition. Uh, you have the option. So one of my old or historic sayings that I like to say was, the more fat you feed a pig, the more it looks like the fat that you feed it. Swine It podcast is only possible with the support of forward-looking and innovative sponsors like Elanco's Prevacent, a new PERS Spective. Visit Prevacent, P-R-R-S dot U-S to learn more. NutriQuest, experts serving producers and delivering breakthrough solutions. Genesis, the first power in genetics. Zimpro, essential trace minerals, exceptional performance. Every pig, a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool. Just all, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Welcome to Swine Eat Podcast. My name is Marcel Gonçalves, your host for today's episode. This episode's sponsor highlight is about NutriQuest. NutriQuest delivers targeted breakthrough solutions to animal producers via nutritional and non-nutritional products, services, and technologies. At NutriQuest, we believe in ingenuity inspired by servitude and that our success comes from helping producers realize improved profitability through optimized technologies and efficient operation. Hello everyone, today we have uh, Dr. Jeff Hansen on the show and he's going to talk about pork fat quality and diet formulation, lessons learned and the impact over the last 40 years. So thanks for our time, Jeff. Thank you, glad to be here. Appreciate that and let's just uh, get right into your, uh, your history first, you know, so tell us how did you get involved in pig production and, and your career to this date? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's been, uh, I've been in the pork industry since 1976, wow. in which I grew up uh, working for my brother-in-law, Zoltenko Farms in south, uh, north central Kansas, and today they have uh, boar studs, ZFI studs, but uh, I grew up working on the farm, and uh, we had fair to finish live, uh, you know, cattle, and and it was a diversified crop and livestock farm. So that got my interest in uh, pork production, and uh, we had sows outside, you mm. know, in dirt lots, and and uh, so I learned all the way through the late '70s until I went to school. I, you know, I went to Nebraska for a short stint, uh, which is where I grew up in. And then uh, I got my bachelor's and master's at Texas A&M and my doctorate at Kansas State. So it's pretty fortunate. I had an influence by uh, Daryl Knaby and, and T.D. Tanksley was a tremendous influence on my career as well as my brother's. And, you know, he studied uh, or they studied pretty extensively amino acid digestibility. So, okay. you know, through my master's and Ph.D., I had uh, exposure into amino acids and digestible formulation. And so that, that became an important part as I went on to K-State and, and uh, we were working at that time really uh, starting to see some of the ideal protein kind of mm -hmm. work come through. And so that influenced us as well uh, as we're coming through K-State. A lot of the somatotropin work was being done and mm -hmm. we started to incorporate that uh, information on ideal protein into how we formulated and uh, really advanced it fairly quickly there from from uh, K-State, you know, I went on to be a faculty member of NC State mm. uh, for a couple years in extension and research and uh, ultimately had an opportunity to start at Murphy Farms in 95. And uh, as a nutritionist and, and uh, director of the research there. And so I worked for uh, Terry Coffee for a lot of those years and in which we, um, you know, I, I led either the research and the, and the uh, nutrition or just the nutrition program. So as we merged through uh, to the Murphy Farms, Murphy Brown, Smithfield mm -hmm. system, uh, you know, I was able to be a part of that growth um, for almost 20 years. And, wow. yeah. and I, left, uh, I left there for an opportunity with NutriQuest and, and have enjoyed the transition. I miss my friends and what I did at Murphy Farms or Smithfield, 
but I love what I do and the people I work with. So it's a really unique opportunity to, you know, do a very different role from having uh, done a lot of different things, at least in, in Smithfield. So. Right. And now more recently with NutriQuest, right? Yes. And so about the last four years, I'm, I've got solid four years experience in sales now. Oh, okay. <laughs> solid for you. <laughs> and uh, have you ever uh, tried to calculate how many pigs you fed? No, but it is, uh, you know, we fed a lot of millions at, at Smithfield and, and uh, Murphy Farms. It was I, always working for the largest uh, producer. I know most people recognize that I don't have much of an ego. Uh, <laughs> but what little bit is there was always satisfied by <laughs> having worked for the largest companies. And, and it, it gives you a truly unique perspective on what the issues are once you get big and how you deal with the processes. And so it is a really different uh, scenario about what you're trying to manage, the daily activities and, and the execution versus a smaller producer that might be able to focus on an individual barn. So it's just different and uh, fun. Very nice. All right, so let's get into the definition of uh, pork fat quality, uh, if you can do that, and also why is this important? Yeah, so... I, you know, I'm just so happy to be have the opportunity to talk about this topic. It's something that I've been very passionate about uh, for most of my career. Having started at uh, Murphy's, you know, we faced a really unique situation in the southeast where, you know, we kept getting these pigs leaner, and then we got massive amounts of these very lean animals, you know, started getting a lot of piatrin in, and, and so... You know, what we found out was that pork fat quality and pork muscle quality weren't one and the same. Mm -hmm. So if we think of, uh, I think the best definition after talking to some friends about this is, you know, um, really thinking about the quantity and composition of the fat mm -hmm. that's in the carcass or in the pork product and, as, and how it relates to the future value of that product. So... As I look at pork fat quality, I consider things like bacon. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when we uh, in the East Coast had, had thin bellies, that gives you a different problem than a thick belly mm -hmm. um, and a different characteristic that the consumer may or may not find appealing. And so uh, we did a lot of work, for example, with Mickey Latour at, uh, at Purdue when he was there. And you know, we ultimately found, for example, fat cell fill mattered. You, okay. you had a lot of cells, but they weren't very well filled. Hmm. So that composition of what's in those cells, but also then, you know, uh, de novo synthesis is affected by the rate of growth. So you, you can see how the composition and quantity of that fat matters, particularly in pork. So as we think about um, that, that compositional aspect, it may be measured in IV, iodine value, uh, I always liked doing a direct measure, uh, the chemical measure, so mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about any prediction equation being mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could look at things like melting point and other characteristics. Uh, many people define it in a lot of different ways at different points in the carcass. What we know for sure is the composition of the fat matters, but the one that often can be missed, and especially in the Midwest, is perhaps the quantity of fat, very thin bellies and very lean animals have led up to uh, problems that we addressed in the Southeast. Uh, certainly, that's, that's still an ongoing issue. So um, that value, though, comes in things like bacon acceptability. Mm -hmm. I can tell you from experience, being the supplier of last resort is not where you want to be. So there's a basic threshold you have to meet when it comes to let's say meat quality, but fat quality as well in pork. Mm -hmm. The same would apply for beef. You can't have soft fat in beef mm. and have an acceptable product in the U.S. Um, your, your hamburger will not, it'll grease out and, mm. and it'll just make a horrible product uh, from a consumer acceptance standpoint. So as we look at defining uh, what that fat quality means, it comes down to how it affects economic value. And that can come in bacon, it can come in the star fat around ham, whether you're going to have ham slices that'll kind of grease out and, mm. and will look bad and affect consumer acceptance. Yeah. Shoulders, oftentimes consumers like to cook shoulders on in the U.S. in uh, a smoker. 
And if it's fallen apart because uh, the fat is really greasy, mm -hmm. uh, high IV, po high polyunsaturated fat, that affects their choice. And so what, what you don't want to be is that supplier left in the, the combo sitting out in the middle of the floor where it's, you're just trying to get rid of it. Too greasy or, uh, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, all right, so let's jump into the historical perspective uh, on fat quality and also, Jeff, some regional differences uh, based on ingredient availability. Yep. And so it, it goes back, uh, in my years of experience, I, I'll, I remember symbol being developed from the National Pork Producers Council and so forth, where in the 70s, you know, we started bringing in a lot of European breeds, increasing prolificacy, and that's really when we started to concentrate down. I know that, I, I want to say uh, Murphy Farms, the first uh, farm, that the sow farm that the Sands Company built, it's called Sands Farm in 1976. So I have a point of reference that uh, it's like the late 70s and 80s, we started to see these very lean animals as we tried to improve the lean carcass yield. And by definition, pork people like pork because of its fat quality characteristics. They like it because of its flavor mm -hmm. and, and it's generally good uh, from a cooking perspective. They like many things about pork that are related to fat. So as we go through this lean uh, time frame of the 80s, um, Smithfield actually developed a product called Lean Generation. One of the, and to my knowledge, one of the only branded fresh meat products ever created. Hmm. And they did that with their own genetics. And it was a very high success. They measured the fat content and it was very low in intramuscular, mm -hmm. meaning it ate about like shoe leather. Now I <laughs> could cook it okay and have it edible, but honestly, People, uh, while they bought that product and, and the success of the other white meat was real, mm -hmm. um, people like pork because of its fat and its flavor. And so you see a transition, that product ran its life, and then I know those guys at Smithfield transitioned over to a Duroc, and it yielded a much more higher quality product. And that's more acceptable to consumers in Asia, which prefer a premium uh quality product from a marbling standpoint, mm -hmm. but also in the U.S. And so I think we have a very superior product to a lot of places in the world. Mm -hmm. It's just cut different. Mm -hmm. And so the regional differences, we ended up seeing this very slow growth in the southeast. Um, we saw less fat cell fill. Mm -hmm. That was a different problem, very thin bellies. You come out to the Midwest and all of a sudden we get the renewable fuel standard that mm -hmm. increases ethanol availability and lots of oil was being left in those. Um, and so then polyunsaturated fat started to create a real problem in the w Midwest. Mm -hmm. It was a different problem than the Southeast, but it was a problem nonetheless. And so they, uh, they, they were faced with a different set of circumstances. And then as the industry started to remove oil, you think of a five to seven cent per pound DDG versus a 25 cent or 30 cent a pound oil, mm -hmm. you were highly motivated to get the oil mm -hmm. out. So we do see that product reduced today. And, and uh, so that has been one of the blessings of mm -hmm. uh, the ethanol industry taking some of the oil out is it decreased the amount of polyunsaturated fat that's out there causing a the problem. Very good. Um, any thoughts on fat quality? Um, between the different countries in your experience? Yeah, so uh, we deal uh, quite a bit, and I've been to a number of customers in Canada. Canada has a unique problem in that they, you know, they have a small population, and they can certainly outproduce their population much like the, UK, the U.S. can for a uh, demand standpoint. And their price uh, competitiveness is less than what it would be in the U.S. Grain basis, we're just the cost of housing and electricity and energy costs would be higher as it's cooler there longer. And so, you know, how they become more sustainable, they've been targeting more of the premium markets. They have small grains, whether that's wheat or barley, less polyunsaturated fat. They have uh, targeted a higher quality product and in fact have displaced a number of the U.S. customers for mm -hmm 
premium product into Japan. Japan it was yeah. a more competitive product for them to produce. It commanded a premium. Um, but that, uh, that, that's been a struggle. I see that in uh, Canada. You look at Mexico, you see a lot more commodity pork being produced and how they uh, cut that product is very different for the consumer in that region mm -hmm. and whether that's an export product or not. Um, so there's, there is very differences, uh, great differences in the product target in those countries. Brazil, Marcio, you know mm -hmm. that um, how the cuts are selected and prepared is very different in that country mm -hmm. to where you don't see as much value in bacon mm -hmm. uh, or a real premium high fat quality type product. Same would be true in Chile where I go. Um, Asia, you know, it depends on the market. Japan is a premium market. Mm -hmm. I think China is, is uh, they're, uh, they're, they're gonna be different, right? So um, it's unique. Korea and Japan, I think, are your true premium markets. And then the white, white tablecloth markets in the U.S. For, for some of that really high quality pork. Very good. Um, as you think about ways to manage the pork fat quality, um, what, uh, what are the options there for a nutritionist uh, out there? Yeah, so the simplest idea I always come back to is, you know, it depends on uh, your situation, where you're at. Uh, certainly managing growth rate, mm -hmm. de novo fat synthesis mm -hmm. is going to put down at most a monounsaturated fat, right? It's going to be a lot of saturated fat and, a, and some amount of a monounsaturated. You're not going to put down a, a polyunsaturated fat. So that largely is going to come from your diet, which means, okay, your diet is a significant source of consternation for the finished product. And you mm -hmm. have to meet a basic threshold. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to feed a lot of distiller's grains um, or vegetable oil, whether that's corn oil, and, and let's say we're trying to get away from feeding animal Mm -hmm. uh, products, um, that's a big piece. We see a lot of corn oil or soybean oil being fed. And, you know, what you're trying to do with that is manage um, the polyunsaturated fat composition. Uh, you have the option. So one of my old or historic sayings that I like to say was, the more fat you feed a pig, the more it looks like the fat that you feed it. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really simple yeah. kind of idea and you remember uh, perhaps you don't in brazil but there's a old book on meats uh from the 20s a picture from the 1920s or 30s where okay. they show peanut oil fed pigs mm -hmm. in which the the uh in the cooler the oil is dripping off the carcass oh wow because it has such a low uh, melting point mm -hmm. and uh, so you know, you, you have to consider that the more you feed that pig, the more de novo fat synthesis mm -hmm. that it's replacing. Mm -hmm. So that's where the root of that idea kind of comes from. So if you go back to 1996, I think it was Dean Boyd uh, prepared uh, the IVP feeding mm -hmm. uh, blueprint. I think. Yeah, I think I can't remember the exact name of that, but. Yeah. But it was Dean, uh, we worked with Dean in those days and Gonzalo and to kind of look at that and say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. IVP feeding, um, you could understand that putting a lot of oil in would create a predictably worse carcass. And so while it's not perfect, um, if, uh, if you look, there's uh, maybe some of the K-State and Iowa State data recently says that, you know, using 18 twos right. as a better predictor. IVP does such a really good job mm -hmm. of predicting it relative to That's the diversity of products that exist out there. So if you take fish oil, mm -hmm. the 18 two equation won't predict its impact. Hmm. Fish oil with IVP would, would be better. And IVP just is iodine value product, right? The yes. I, the IV of the product, right? So it's the average, you know, the IV of the fat times the percent fat. And uh, so it gives you a scale, a scalarizer of the type and quantity of fat in that diet. So by definition, then you could figure out um, feeding wheat or, mm -hmm. or uh, sorghum or barley, which you would tend to see you know, at least wheat and barley in the small grains in, in Canada, 
you would see less of these issues because you fed a diet lower in basically polyunsaturated fat. And as you go closer to uh, the U.S. where we have a lot of corn uh, products, we get, you know, whether that's uh, distiller's grains or it could have been corn gluten feed, other byproducts of, of uh, corn production, you know, would come in and hominy feed, just different things were available. But using a high starch product will generally result in a firmer carcass mm -hmm. because de novo synthesis is largely going to be only a monounsaturate or uh, a saturated product mm -hmm. or saturated fat. So as we think about that, um, you can use IVP, but it doesn't mean that there's not value in feeding diets high in polyunsaturated fats. Mm -hmm. So it could be that if your packer, you know, is offering some penalty for, uh, for IV carcass measurements, so mm -hmm. it's measuring your pork fat quality and assigns value to it, um, DDGs might get cheap enough and corn oil might get cheap mm -hmm. enough that you could still feed those and take that penalty. Right. Um, the alternative is you can use, there are technologies out there like, uh, like the product we have called Lipinate, mm -hmm. which affects uh, de novo fat synthesis and, and uh, basically stops the monounsaturate. But, but that product uh, works well. You can use as much DDGs as you want, save, get that savings, and then use uh, this other product to recoup that back. We've seen customers uh, do that with, try to do it with tallow or palm oil, some of those harder fats. Uh, but again, where you run into the problem is the total amount of fat goes up mm -hmm. and you haven't probably replaced corn oil, mm -hmm. which is already three and a half percent, right? Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so you get a lot of uh, polyunsaturated fat coming from your corn product. And as long as you're feeding that, you still have the risk of accumulating these polyunsaturated fats. Very good. Very good. Now, a little bit of a, what do you call, a fire round. <laughs> so, uh, barrel versus gilt, which one has higher uh, or firmer, firmer uh, fat? Yeah, so barrows, which have, tend to have a little bit more back fat or total body fat, um, we've always found had about a two point higher IV mm -hmm. or two point lower IV than a gilt. Um, my apologies. Mm -hmm. um, now, where, where there's customers that are using immunocastration, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you find less difference because the mm -hmm. gilts, they can actually use, uh, I, I think there's people out there using that and getting a growth response from mm -hmm. the immunocastration mm -hmm. in the gilts, which now puts them even you know, on par or worse than barrows okay. or boars in that case. Right. Okay. How about pelleting? So there's uh, pretty good evidence out there. I think that pelleting uh, does increase IV. If I was pelleting, I would tell, of course, my supervisor that wasn't the case because <laughs> I never wanted to give up the value. But I think, uh, you know, there's some work out there that says that it does. It's not that obvious to me. Could mm -hmm. really only be because you change digestibility okay. of that product. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And then, um, good. Anything else uh, in general on fat quality before we move to the three questions we ask every guest? No, I think, you know, the consumer preference, the, the idea that people have to remember is you have to meet a basic threshold. Mm -hmm. And then you go from just meeting that threshold to what is the most premium product. And you know it, there is a value chain throughout that. Uh, it's generally not linear. So being, being greater at it or better you know, isn't necessarily better. The consumer right. just has a basic threshold and then you get the very premium product. So you know, making sure that they meet that and, and uh, take advantage of all the technologies that are out there. We see customers that won't use DDGs because of the risk mm -hmm. it might uh, impair mm -hmm. product quality. There is enough evidence out there. We can manage it very effectively to whatever outcome we want. And there are tools out there to do that. Very good. Is there a good uh, source of, uh, well, I guess the NRC has some values for IVP or not? I don't recall now. 
Yeah, well, I think at a minimum, the fat uh, values, you can mm. either use a calculated or uh, really any source out there, you can use the IV for the fat, mm. the base fat. Mm -hmm. So if corn oil has got a, a certain IV, 125, uh, soy oils mm. maybe 130. So knowing those, you can calculate, can calculate. the IVP uh, pretty well for any product. With the equations available. Yeah. Very good. Isn't it time your PERS protocol evolved? Elanco's Prevacent PERS is safe and effective, offering at least 26 weeks of immunity duration against the respiratory form of PERS. As the first and only on-market USDA-licensed vaccine containing a contemporary Lineage 1 field strain, Prevacent is a contemporary solution. Connect with your veterinarian or an Elanco representative to understand how Prevacent can fit your operation. Visit prevacentprrs.us to learn more. Prevacent, it's time for a new PERS perspective. It is time to our famous three. All right, Jeff. So the three questions we ask every guest every episode, is what is your favorite swine-related resource, books, or, or whatever it is? Yeah, so I'd say... I know uh, I've heard many of your other guys talk about this. Uh, Wayne Cast actually brought up one of my true favorites, which is a trop raising the pig in tropical climates. Mm -hmm. uh, but truthfully, my favorite is the ARC, the last published version mm -hmm. of the ARC in 1981. Wow. I think it was 81. Okay. Might have been 91. But it was still one of my favorite books because what it taught me was uh, how to determine factorial requirements mm -hmm. and how it can be successful mm -hmm. and looking at problems in a factorial way um, for whether it's building amino acid requirements or phosphorus and calcium. So, okay. In the ARC, I've seen the name, but uh, is Agricultural is Research Council. So it's the European Euro NR Europe. NRC, if you will. Uh -huh. I think it was the last published year. I think I, I actually stole Terry Coffey's copy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, what is your favorite book unrelated to, to swine or being a book or a resource that you follow? Yeah, so for me, I think Good to Great and Built to Last are two of my favorite mm -hmm. books. Uh, Jim Collins, mm -hmm. from a business perspective, those are just two fantastic books I recommend for anybody uh, in, in our industry or any industry mm -hmm. for that matter to read. But one of my most recent favorites is uh, we, we read this book called The Servant. Okay. And uh, servant around servant leadership, and it is uh, it is a good lesson for anybody about how to lead people, and uh, Interesting. just a wonderful book. This is called the servant. servant. So, last question, Jeff: What separates successful swine professionals from those that are not, in your opinion? Yeah. So I, I listen. Uh, actually, I listen pretty intently to Gonzalo Castro's answer, and and he embodies uh, to me what drives success, and that's passion. Mm -hmm. uh, passion and commitment, and that servant mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, here is, uh, whether that's Alberto Casarin or Randy Stacker, you know, you go to any of these people that have been around the industry for lots of years, and to me, what they embody is a passion mm -hmm. for uh, what they do and to serve that industry. Mm -hmm. um, there's different people for different things, but. Uh, I know Gonzalo is a great example of someone that just has absolute passion for yes. his industry and embodies that in everything that they do. Yes, that's, that's very, very true, very nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I got impressed with Gonzalo. He's, he sent the latest research sometimes that, that, that uh, we are not aware of. Very good, Jeff. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.